Welcome, welcome, welcome. We are so glad to have another full house for our wonderful speaker series. I believe this is our third, right Arlene? Yes, in a, in a, in a series that we'll, which will be many as we continue on. We are so fortunate uh, to have our wonderful speaker tonight, Paul Jenkin, who is going to be introduced by our wonderful Arlene Westifer. Um, so Arlene, thank you so much. Well, uh, when I was uh, looking into preparing uh, the introduction, I came across something that always warms my heart. About 25 years ago, three people in California became dissatisfied with their situation and decided to do something about it. And out of that effort came the Surfrider Foundation, which is now in, I believe, 81 countries, wow. and uh, does a great uh, deal of uh, you know, environmental activism to uh, make the waves and ocean and beaches uh, as pristine as possible for all of us. And uh, the gentleman who's going to speak tonight is the environmental director of the Surfrider Foundation in Ventura, and his name is Paul Jenkins. If I speak without the mic, can you guys hear me back there? Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Because I'll have to. I've got to use the mouse and the mic and everything else. So let me let me just try this and see. I'll try and speak loudly. Um, thank you, Arlene. You've invited me to speak at a couple of different um, venues in the past, and, and it's always good. We've got a good turnout here tonight, and uh, I hope that uh, you guys all find this to be an interesting presentation. Um, Surfrider, as she mentioned, I'm not sure about 82 countries, but um, Surfrider is uh, around the world today. And um, I should mention that we do have one of the founders of the foundation right here, uh -huh. Glenn Henning. Um, good to see you, Glenn. Good to see you, Paul. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about uh, uh, water. And, you know, water is obviously important to surfers because without water we wouldn't be surfing. But uh, more specifically, I want to see... Here we go. Okay. Um, why fresh water is important to surfers. Um, the focus of uh, most of my efforts over the last almost 20 years has been right here at this location where the ocean meets the land. Um, this is right at the mouth of the Ventura River, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. Um, and you can see uh, the fairgrounds, the river mouth, uh, but more importantly, you can see that the way the waves wrap around the land there. Can anybody tell me what call that sort of land formation where the river enters the ocean? A delta. And so uh, this is like the Nile River Delta or the Amazon. All these rivers where they go into the ocean, uh, uh, the sediment deposits on the coast and create the delta. That's what creates the surfing waves that um, are best for surfing. Here in California, we're very fortunate to have several of these point breaks all up and down the coast, Rincon Point up the coast, Malibu Point down the coast, and in the middle here, uh, Surfers Point or Sea Street. Um, <laughs> in the course of my uh, investigations over the years, it's led me upstream, and here I am actually snorkeling in the Ventura River, which seems like an unlikely thing to do, but uh, actually doing uh, steelhead snorkel surveys, looking for endangered steelhead trout in the river. Um, but the real point is that 
pretty much all the impacts that we have to our coastal ecosystem come from upstream, somewhere up the river or somewhere up the land, and it all roots back to the way that we manage our fresh water. And uh, just in brief, right here on the Ventura River, we're seeing stress. We're seeing the signs of stress. This is uh, the, the Ventura River at Foster Park. And Foster Park is one of the primary well fields for the city of Ventura. Uh, we've been monitoring water quality at this site for more than a decade. And in that time, this is the first time in more than a decade that the river has actually dried up in this location. At the same time, I'm sure you guys have all seen in the news and are aware of the situation at McGrath State Beach. McGrath State Beach is flooded. McGrath State Beach is not flooded with salt water, it's flooded with fresh water. And that fresh water is coming from upland, and a lot of that water is coming from Foster Park. So we have not enough water in one place, too much water in another place. And it's causing all kinds of problems and all kinds of regulatory issues associated with that. We have endangered steelhead trout upstream and downstream. And um, how do we deal with this? So one of the things that I embarked upon a few years ago was just trying to kind of get the community aware of how things are connected and what was going on out there. Can anybody tell me what a watershed is? <laughs> Where the water runs off? <laughs> Where water runs off? Yeah, it's, it's not an outhouse, <laughs> obviously. Um, uh, this is our watershed. This is the Ventura River watershed. And you can see here that you can pretty much trace the ridge line goes all the way from the mouth of the Ventura River all the way up around the top of the mountains and back down. This is about a 225 square mile area and every drop of rain that falls within that ridge line, within that watershed, flows into the Ventura River and ultimately out at the mouth of the Ventura River unless it's pumped out and taken away for some other use. Uh, watershed may already connote the wrong uh, way of managing water. Another term for watershed oftentimes is a catchment or a catchment basin. And here it kind of symbolically, the way that the land captures the water and holds it and, and uh, it can be used in that manner as opposed to shedding the water off the land. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this paradigm shift that we're trying to uh, effect and it is happening right now with how we manage our fresh water and how it impacts the coast and the ocean. Um, on what is a watershed, we went out and kind of surveyed people in the community and we ended up creating a, a video about this. This is the trailer for that. What is a watershed? Certainly in this for the last 20 years. 
we have an intact river. It's not dead yet. In the worst case scenario, theoretically, we can take water out of the ocean. At some point, I think we all need to come together to solve some of the problems that we're facing. produced about a half hour um, documentary. Uh, it was actually on PBS, uh, I think in 2011, and played nationwide. Um, the video does stream online and you can watch the whole thing. It really highlights some of the things that people are doing within the Ventura River watershed. Um, a lot of our, our partners, uh, land conservancies, um, and others that are working to try and uh, protect and restore the Ventura River. So, like I said, the question really is how can fresh water management save the ocean? Um, and uh, a few years ago, the San Diego chapter was really wrestling with some issues with some uh, desalinization plants that. Uh, a couple of them have since been approved or in the process of being approved um, to take ocean water, uh, take the salt out of it, and use that as a potable water supply. This is something that can have potential impacts to sea life and coastal health. It's also very energy intensive. But more importantly, we're dumping millions and millions of gallons of treated wastewater into the ocean every year. So actually every day. So, um, the idea that you would take your water, treat it to almost potable standards, dump it in the ocean, then pump it back out to remove the salt from it, this is what we, we're calling when the water cycle becomes the cycle of insanity. And when you think about it in those terms, especially in places like San Diego, where they're actually importing water from hundreds of miles away, uh, using it once, treating it, dumping it in the ocean, to start building highly energy intensive desalinization plants to then take it back out of the ocean when you could directly recycle that wastewater. Um, it becomes a very complicated uh, issue to try and explain all this, and we were very fortunate to have uh, a very talented animator um, provide services to create an animated. So I'm going to show you the trailer for this cycle of insanity video. Now I got some. Yeah. So we created this short video again that describes uh, all the problems that we have with the way that we're managing water, but then also goes in and describes all the solutions. So this is sort of the cycle of insanity as it is today, where we have large urban areas with huge amounts of urban runoff. Every time it rains, it's all flushed into the ocean. Uh, we've got in this little graphic, there's actually a dam upstream there, there's agricultural, um, there's all these wastewater treatment plants along the coast, and in the meantime, we're wasting tons of energy in the way that we transfer, treat, and process water. So, um, defining the problem is really the first step in coming to know your H2O. And this, this uh, you know, the San Diego chapter of Surfrider has been really creative in some of the the catchphrases that they've used for some of their campaigns. A lot of you have probably seen those bumper stickers that say, hold on to your butts. Um, that's talking about cigarette butts on the beach. And underneath it says that the beach is not an ashtray. 
Um, San Diego chapter came up with this idea, know your H2O, understand where your water's coming from, where it's going to, and we could be one step closer to understanding why we have some of the problems that we do. Um, understanding that a lot of these problems can be solved, and coming to a common vision of what that might look like is, is another key step in coming to solve these, these issues. Um, but I think most importantly, and this is what Surfrider has been really good at, is coming out with actionable solutions, things that we can do personally today to actually make a difference. And here you can see, it says, this is from the video, it's a, uh, from the cartoon, it says, voted coolest yard in the world. That's, that's this ocean-friendly garden concept. It's something that we can do that I'll talk more about in a moment. So. Uh, when looking at a watershed on a watershed scale, looking at how all these problems are seemingly not connected but are, um, that's when we need to come up with integrated solutions, solutions that get to the root cause of the problem that can solve the problem from a systems approach. Um, one of the things that you might have seen or heard about is integrated regional watershed water management. And this is something that the state has uh, funding for uh, typically goes into large, big infrastructure projects that water agencies do. And here in the Cycle of Insanity video, we symbolize the water managers as these drips. And you can see they're all sitting around looking and saying, well, the supply's good, we don't have a problem. As long as there's enough water, water coming out of the taps, there's no problem. But the reality is that um, nobody's really looking at things on an integrated uh, system-wide basis. So last year, I had a, a graduate student group from the Bren School at UCSB, in Environmental Science, uh, Policy and Science, Science and Management, um, did a uh, study on the Ventura River, specifically looking at how water is used within the watershed. And they put together a computer model. It was the first time. There's there's probably 15 different water agencies, there's two, three different sanitary districts, there's all these different water management agencies that don't necessarily coordinate what they do or share information. So we went through and mapped the watershed, well, the graduate students did, um, looking at, and you notice they call it catchments within this model, which is actually good. Put in uh, precipitation into the model, put in all the different land uses throughout the watershed, uh, rivers, groundwater, looking at where uh, water runs off and where it goes to, put in all the cities and agriculture, all of the extraction that comes out of the system, and the return flows on the wastewater treatment plant. And then started looking at an overall water budget for, for the whole watershed. And you can see here that about half the water that we use goes to residential about more than half of that goes on to landscapes. And then a lot of it goes to agriculture. And in the Ventura River, only a small amount actually goes to industry. The recommendations that they came up with from their study by actually going and using this model to determine ways that could actually improve ecosystem health was to encourage widespread adoption of ocean-friendly gardens and gray water systems. This is all stuff that we can do uh, on our own properties at home. Um, can anybody tell me what gray water is? Wash water. Wash water. Um, Shower. You know, typically we would call black water, which is sewer water that comes out of our homes um, and has pathogens that are very difficult to remove, whereas gray water is water that's been used in our washing machines um, or in our showers that can be put directly on our landscapes at home, rather than going into the wastewater treatment plant, maybe somewhere way down below, which then gets treated and pumped out into the ocean or into the rest of the beach, in the case of the um, Another recommendation was to implement uh, decentralized infiltration bas basins to capture stormwater runoff. Basically, this is going in and putting in, restoring wetland areas that can actually capture the water within the watershed um, and they also turned out that our water rates are actually pretty low. Now, if you live in Oxnard, they're not as low because you're dealing with imported water. But within the Ventura River, the water rates are lower than the state average. Um, one of the solutions is 
wastewater reuse. Now you can think about how many millions and millions of gallons of water is going into the ocean every day, all up and down the California coast. Some of it's treated to tertiary, pretty high standards. Some of it's not treated as high. But regardless, there are uh, pollutants that get into the ocean from this. Um, and this is the Santa Clara River estuary. I've been part of an ongoing study looking at the Santa Clara River estuary where initially the State Water Board determined that the uh, wastewater treatment plant would be an enhancement to the, to the uh, biology of the estuary. Um, they're now going back and re-looking at that because of pressure from environmental organizations saying, look, not only are you flooding this thing unnaturally, but there's high levels of nutrients, you're having uh, uh, algae blooms within the, the estuary. For many years it doesn't breach, and then as we've seen, it comes all the way down to the south there, and then uh, this last year, two years it's been going in and flooding the campground. Um, so as part of this study, the city has actually been forced now, because of some legal action, to start taking a look at how they would recycle water. And this is a very complicated and expensive uh, approach to actually taking, you can see the red pipe there is actually an existing pipeline that goes to use reclaimed water on the golf courses. But then adding more and more pipes to pump the water back up the hill to places where it could be reused is something that they're looking at. Um, I've been advocating that it might make some more sense to build a separate wastewater treatment plant outside of the sea rise inundation area where it's currently located, back in East Ventura, which would allow for reuse back in that area or even injection into the groundwater to restore the water tables which are being impacted from sea uh, seawater intrusion. And this is something that they are currently doing down in Orange County. has been very successful and there's a lot of information about that if you do some research on it. Um, city just took a closer look at their water budget and um, demand is pretty high, 18,000 uh, acre feet per year. And the supply might be perhaps a little less than that to a lot more if it's a really wet year. Um, at the same time, the average wastewater discharge about 9 million gallons a day going into that estuary. That turns out to be about that much water right there, about half the water that the city is using ends up going through the wastewater treatment plant and into the estuary. Um, if we were to recycle that, that means almost 50% of the plant <coughs> could be offset through recycled water, which is a significant difference when you look at Foster Park, which is dry today, they're still pumping. They're still pumping the, the aquifer down deeper and deeper. Um, another thing is called green streets. 80% of the impervious surface area within a watershed is transportation related. So we're looking at the streets and parking lots primarily that create a tremendous amount of runoff. And um, the way that our streets have been designed typically is that they have curbs all the way along the side and every so often you have a little drain and the water goes away. But where does that water go? It goes into the concrete storm drains that end up going straight out to the ocean and Green Streets is a way to reverse that trend. City of Ventura has done a couple of proposals for Green Streets. And you can see here this kind of big concrete jungle world as it currently exists on the top image. And how that would look down below if you were able to put in uh, bioswales and pervious concrete and other things that would be able to capture that runoff, including the trees. Um, I got really interested in this quite a long time ago when I started seeing the runoff that was coming off the city of Ventura into Pierpont Bay. It turns out a lot of that runoff was actually industrial discharge. It was water from a water purification plant that was being discharged. Their wastewater was discharged into the storm drain that was going straight out to the ocean. But in the process, I learned that the, the natural drainages that used to exist under the city have been completely buried underground in concrete. And so water coming off the hills goes underground somewhere up there and then pops out right down, right down by the beach. 
And uh, anybody who's familiar uh, with San Juan there, when it rains, the streets always flooded and the roads closed and there's mud all over the place and it's a disaster. Um, we actually went through and mapped. You, you might not be able to see from way back there, but there are um, some white lines on there that are all the concrete storm drains that go out into Pierpont Bay. And we went through and looked at areas where there was problems, where there's a large amount of impervious area, uh, parking lots and that type of thing, and where there was areas for opportunity to capture some of that runoff, looking at parks and open space and schools and other areas uh, throughout the watershed, and looking at ways that, um, you know, systematically, if you look at it on, from a watershed level, you can go and, and capture some of that water in the parks. And if you think about it, it's kind of ridiculous. We're pumping the Ventura River dry, we're treating the water to drinking water standards, we're pumping it up the hill, and we're pouring it all in this park to keep the grass green. And then when it rains, the whole park is curved off so that no water will run onto it, and it all goes straight into the gutter and out to the ocean. So we're throwing away water when it rains, and then we're using tons of water when it's dry to keep these areas green. So looking on a, on a watershed scale, um, you can see that this is the, the drainage, the underground drain. There's opportunities to capture a lot of that water before it ever gets into that drain, before it gets out to the ocean. And uh, looking at the historic aerials, I found out that there used to be a wetland right here at the mouth of the um, Barranca that came down the hill. And restoring that wetland so that it wasn't just a concrete channel to process naturally a lot of that wastewater, a lot of that stormwater before it got onto the beach would also help with improving ocean water quality. Um, now finally, this is, this is the idea of ocean-friendly gardens. And I'm going to talk about how um, at Surfrider we've begun to actually do this on private property, on homeowners' properties. And this is a sign, this ocean-friendly garden sign that you'll start seeing around the place on uh, gardens that have been converted to be ocean-friendly. And you can see it says CPR, CPR for your yard. Conservation, permeability, and retention. So, um, so much of our landscape has been designed to intentionally create runoff, to get the water off the site as quickly as possible, get it into the streets and into the storm drains and out to the ocean. To reverse that trend, we don't want to waste water, we want to plant Plants other than grass that don't use large amounts of water and irrigation. Increase the permeability of the site so that water that does end up on the site from rainfall or from your gutters can soak in and retain that water on site through that uh, permeability. Um, 2010 was when we really got ramped up with the Ocean Friendly Gardens program in partnership with the city of Ventura. And, uh, it goes through a whole training process. The idea is to actually train people and then do hands-on workshops so that you can learn how to do this and then do it on your own property. So there's a basics class, um, a how hands-on workshop, and then a garden assistance party, they call it. So garden assistance party, you get a bunch of volunteers out and you get out and tear out the lawn and replace it with an ocean-friendly garden. And this is a picture of a couple of the, the people, some of the first ocean-friendly garden owners that we have in Ventura. Um, we went back after the first big rainfall, after that garden had been installed, and you can see here that the downspout from the gutters that used to actually be connected underground to go straight out to the street um, was now diverted onto the landscape, and this dry creek bed was created, and that's all made with cobble and rock so that it doesn't just erode all the soil away when it does this. And most of the runoff off of that property ends up meandering down through that dry creek bed and soaking in, as opposed to being shunted straight out to the street. So that's how we capture really a lot of runoff on a very small amount of area. Here's one that we did uh, last year. Um, this is what the garden looked like beforehand, and this is what it looked like after. 
So again here, the picture doesn't show, but there's a downspout over here that's diverted into this bioswale dry creek bed right here. So all the runoff off the roof gets captured in here. But we went one step further with this. We actually came and cut the curb. So you can see down here this cut in the curb. Now, runoff that's coming down the street flows onto that property there. And this is the city parkway that runs between the sidewalk and the street. So that has also been converted to ocean friendly. So it's, it's got gravel and, and cobble down underneath, so it's very permeable. And runoff from the street is now captured on the property as well. And so you can see here in action. So the idea now is we're, we're taking steps up from the property to the street and then looking bigger and bigger. So this idea of Know Your H2O starts with ocean-friendly gardens, goes to green streets, looks at wastewater reuse and other efficient water uses, integrated water management, looking on a watershed scale at how we can integrate our water management. And so it's at home, in your neighborhood, in your city, in your watershed, building up in scale. Um, but also, this idea that the individual action that we take at home can, in fact, impact public policy. When they see that people are taking action of their own accord, then the idea starts to sink in. And the other way around, the public policy, through incentive programs and other uh, uh, partnerships with government, we can also expedite the individual action at home. Um, so another way of looking at this is integrated water management, looking at the whole watershed, um, ocean-friendly gardens. We start putting ocean-friendly gardens in, not just one, but all over the place. We put in green streets. We start to systematically capture the runoff from the streets. Um, you know, maybe we're looking at a desal plant. As opposed to that, we go in and put a water recycling. And in the end, the big picture, the long-term vision is that we're going to transfer and that's transform that cycle of insanity into uh, the restored water cycle. The more natural, more mimics more the more the natural water cycle instead of uh, perpetuating these things that we've done to kind of short circuit the natural processes within the watershed. Um, there's a ton of information about this. Uh, all over the place, but my blog, VenturaRiver.org, has a lot of uh, information, not only about this, but the other projects that I'm working on in Ventura, the Surface Point Restoration Project, and the Mitilaha Dam removal, among others. Um, and uh, uh, also wanted to say, we do have books that describe how to build ocean-friendly gardens, and we got a little brochure. I've got a bunch of these brochures if anybody would like to take them home, and I, the books are $15 if you're interested. Um, we did actually just complete uh, an ocean-friendly gardens program in Oxnard. Was anybody here having to be a part of that? No, it just, it just completed now, so I was hoping I could say, and if you're really interested, you can go to the city of Oxnard. Um, but, uh, City of Oxnard, City of Ventura, um, other uh, county, other government agencies are really catching on to the ocean-friendly gardens concept. And our aim with that, like I said, is to be able to translate that to larger municipal projects that can make even more of a difference as we move forward. So, um, with that, I guess we open up to questions. Uh, do you have a program for convincing the public to use recycled water we had a terrible time down in Glendale uh, with the Van uh, Nuys uh, plant and the others <clears throat> because we could get water back up to the parks and water the lawns there, the golf courses, etc. But as soon as we wanted to put it back in the groundwater up near the mountains, oh, we're not going to drink that stuff comes out of our toilet. And <laughs> just going back into the groundwater. Yeah, they wouldn't. They right. refused to let them do it. So going back into the ground, what they call that indirect potable reuse. That's uh, reusing the water after it's been put back into the ground again. 
The, the irony with that is that in Orange County, the water that they're putting back into the aquifer is actually cleaner than the water that's already in the aquifer. <laughs> <laughs> so, they don't believe it. As soon as they hear you're drinking your toilet water, right. they're, 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 that. they're treating it to a standard where you could drink it. Then they're putting it back in the aquifer, but when you pump it back out, you've got to treat it again. And so, um, you know, it's... And the other unfortunate part about this was in San Diego, somebody got the bright idea of, of coining the term toilet to tap. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think they were necessarily in favor of the water, but uh, the toilet to tap really um, slowed down the down there too. Um, and at the same time, the regulations are still coming online. The state and, and the EPA still have not really finalized regulations on, on recycled water. So all of this is emerging. Uh, the indirect potable reuse is, is pretty easy to do, but direct potable reuse is still a, a little bit of a regulatory challenge. Um, but it's obvious that uh, other places in the world, Singapore is almost 100% recycling their water. Um, it's being done, uh, obviously, in uh, the Middle East, where they have very little water. Uh, they're making the most of what they've got. And I think as, as our population grows and our water supply dwindles, as we're seeing today, uh, it's going to become a necessity, not just a nice thing to do. So um, recycled water definitely is the future. Um, I have a question on the drugs that everybody takes, no matter what it is. How does that get filtered out of the water? Yeah, that's one of the questions that is still open-ended. And they call it... Uh, Contaminant, contaminants of emergent, emergent concern, CECs. Um, and these are all the um, uh, prescription drugs and everything else that people take that uh, our bodies flush out down the toilet. And, um, uh, most, uh, most of that is taken care of through advanced uh, reverse osmosis and um, other treatment. Uh, but it's still a question of how much of that might remain. I do know that in, uh, uh, I think it was in London, they did a study and they found out that uh, most of the population had antidepressants in their system. Not because they were taking it, but because they were drinking the water. Oh, oh wow. wow. And that's also affecting the fish. <laughs> yes. And it affects uh, uh, the fish, and I'm sure that you're also referring to um, estrogen mimicking compounds, which can end up creating. Um, uh, uh, gender uh, switches and changes within uh, the fish life. So it's definitely a problem. Um, but if you think about a place like the Colorado River, uh, every city from Colorado all the way down to San Diego is uh, taking water out, using it, putting it back in the river. And then the city downstream is taking it back out, reusing it, putting it back in the river, taking it out. So. Most of the water that we use has been used more than once. Um, it's just the case of what happens when you're right at the end of the pipe, the last place to go is the ocean. Um, and because our population is getting much more dense right next to the ocean, it makes more sense than ever to try and capture that before it goes into the ocean and reuse it, as opposed to pumping it into the ocean, having all the impacts of the ocean, and then pumping it back out. So, um, these are not trivial questions, and I appreciate you bringing that up, because maybe I made it sound like it was easy, but it is not. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I have a curiosity uh, with the plant in Oxnard that got them in trouble with the district attorney and all that. What that plant supposed to do? $249 million worth of something. Yeah, that's, <laughs> it's a huge, very complex uh, project that... Um, uh, from my understanding, a lot of it has to do with Simi Valley and their uh, salty groundwater up there. And they're trying to use more groundwater, so they're pumping the salts out. It's called a brine line that they're pumping all the way down, and it's going out, going to be going out into the ocean at uh, Wainimi. Um, and along the way, they're trying to reclaim and you reuse some of that, in the city's uh, uh, water recycling. Um, a lot of times, uh, I think that these very big, very expensive infrastructure projects 
uh, perhaps create more problems than uh, they anticipate. And a lot of the solutions lie at home. Using your gray water, reusing that shower water right at home, and uh, instead of pouring treated drinking water on a vast green lawn, let's talk about using more climate appropriate plants. And um, you know, the smaller decentralized solutions that you can do uh, for cheap on a vast scale are a lot of times more effective than spending millions and millions of dollars on very complex engineering solutions. Life changing out compact incandescent to compact fluorescent to avoid the implementation of a nuclear power plant or another coal fired or oil fired power plant, those kind of things. Yeah, and groundswell the general population needs to do. Yeah, the, the kind of idea that conservation should come first before you start building new power plants, um, you know, kind of the same. Um, a lot of times with water, it's always seen, there's always seems to be another source. Let's just go and drill another well, and we got more water. So we waste more because water's cheap, and we keep finding more. We kind of run out of those. We're not, there's not a lot more water to find anymore, so uh, it's time to start thinking. Of, uh, we can water. slow down now because we just had another foot of snow at Mammoth. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the other challenge. We go through these drought and flood cycles. So while we're talking about drought today, next time I'm here, I'll probably be talking about flood. That's a whole other challenge. It's all related. <laughs> well, as we haven't discussed, we've talked kind of about the dissolved uh, contaminants, but there's, there's a lot of debris that finds its way into our watershed. I know that some places, though, uh, storm drains have catch basins and things like that, but I don't wish they always maintained properly because I used to work in open space adjacent to those areas. And the open space would just be trashed after the first couple of big storms. And then that just goes right down. And you're, you're not, they're not taking that and reclaiming it. I'm just not sure where it's going or is it all going into the ocean. I think if you have any kind of comment on that. Um. I mean, these are all things where now a lot of uh, the stormwater best management practices that are required by cities are to have, uh, in an area that's, that's been deemed impacted by trash, to put trash excluder devices on their storm drains. Usually what that means is if there's a lot of trash, it plugs up the storm drain and the street floods until somebody comes along and cleans it out. <laughs> um, but that's an example where something like a, a green street would now, that would float onto the, onto the bioswale and into the plants. And it wouldn't be the best place, but it would get captured there before it got into that concrete storm drain. Um, the way I see uh, concrete storm drains is like a short circuit. You completely short circuit the system so that every drop that lands on your roof, that goes in the gutter, that goes on the driveway, goes in the street, goes in that concrete storm drain, and it's a straight shot out to the ocean. So, Anywhere that you can break that short circuit along the way, you can begin to make a difference. So starting diverting your gutter, and then doing green streets at the storm drains, or uh, converting a concrete channel into a more natural creek. Uh, they call that a lot of times daylighting a creek, taking that underground creek and letting you see the light of day. All of those things cumulatively can have a, have a great positive impact. Um. I'm just curious if there's been how much um, information we can get on fracking and the effects of fracking on our water supply and what it's doing to our community. Because uh, right. The fracking thing has really come front and center just in the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there is the Dogger website, the De Department of Gas and Energy or something. Um, and there's more and more organizations now really focusing on that. There's actually a group in Ojai that just formed when uh, they found out that the uh, oil company was applying for permit to frack up in the upper Ojai. Um, so uh, there's a lot of information coming out about that now, and the industry is still very uh, reluctant to um, reveal a lot of their secrets. So. Um, it's definitely something that, you know, if you're interested in it, there's probably somebody around here uh, beginning to get organized on that. And, and if you haven't seen it, uh, Gasland and 
podcast I am too mm-hmm. are pretty good exposés on what some people have had to deal with. And you know, I just I just drove down Harbor and they're they're building a they're drilling a new well right along Harbor across from the uh, Mandalay power plant there. Uh, I was up in on the Ventura River and a guy told me all the wells that you see they're they're white and red. Those are all fracking wells. Yeah, I think it's been around. A, it's been a, it's been a process. It's been around a long time. Well, they were steam fracking up at Taft in Ohio when I was a little kid. Yeah, yeah that was a long time ago. I think <laughs> it's changed now with the scope and the nature of what they're doing. Yeah, yeah they kind expanded. Of, they got the easy oil outs, and now they're going for the for the, for the yeah. reserves that are deeper. Um, so. Well, the fracking. My understanding is they've devised a new system of fracking that goes like down and horizontal. Right. Yeah, and then so it's going to wreak more havoc than ever. Yeah, I happen. understand that the wells that were drilled along uh, McGrath here were actually slant drilling offshore and fracking offshore there. So uh, there's a there's a lot there's happening a lot around here. So uh, we th- we might have already seen a lot of impact to it, but we don't know about yet. It's off of McGrath. Oh yeah. So that maybe that's why the water is diverting. You know, the flooding is happening in the ground. No, yeah. no. That water is coming from the city's wastewater treatment plant. So that nine million gallons a day just accumulates, and as long as the berm doesn't breach, it keeps accumulating, and it seeps through a little bit, but it, it generates a much higher water level in that estuary than it would be natural. The normal flow knocks down the the swell that the ocean comes in, the normal flow would tear that apart but because everything, the conditions haven't been right, that berm out to the ocean has held the water back. So it just was allowed to build up. So another hand somewhere way back there. Good evening. My name is Jeff Nesley. A few years ago I went to a water saving program and they suggested the water that you get from your hot water heater to your sink and to your shower may take anywhere from two to five gallons or more. So they suggested you start, and I put mine in a bucket, and I save about eight to 12 gallons a day just reclaiming the hot water, either for my water washing, I mean for my plants, or for my washing machine. But a lot of people are not gonna do that because it's an arduous task. Has anybody given any concept of how you could reclaim that water and put it back into use instead of letting it go down. Uh, you know, I think about this every time I take a shower, and it takes <laughs> five minutes for the hot water to get there. Um, that's a good one. There's a there's a couple of different ways to do it. One of it one one way is to actually have a uh, point of use hot water heater. Yeah. So if you have a uh, demand water heater right there where your bathroom is or where your where your um, kitchen is, uh, and a lot of times you can have small electric ones. They're going to waste some electricity, but once your hot water gets there, they're not going to be um, going as much. And then there's another system where you can recirculate the hot water. And um, so a lot of people do that. And, um, so there's there's different ways to do that, but I'm, I'm with you. That, that whole um, watch that water go down the drain until you can warm it up to hot water. There's one in the back. Take a cold shower. The the overflow or the you kind of have a valve in the bottom of the water here. So you hook a Grumman up one with a switch inside, and you take a three inch, three eight inch flexible hose, run it to the farthest hot water you have the key in there, and just put the switch on and run it for a few minutes. And your hot water will come out right when you turn the tap on. Yep. And the total cost is probably going to be about five hundred dollars. Yes. What about the other uh, plumbing problem that comes from that, the drainage of your pipe, hair, toothpaste, so on, if that's not getting flushed by that water that you're capturing? Oh, you're talking about on a gray water system. Um, so if, if you're actually diverting your shower directly into your gray water system to go out and water your avocado tree or whatever else it might be out there, um, uh, it does need to be designed correctly. So right now, you can, without a permit, if you have the right setup and you don't have to go through an uh, interior wall, you can do your laundry to landscape. And there's very simple laundry to landscape um, you know, ways to do that. 
Uh, the showers and kitchen sinks and those kind of things need, need a more advanced degree of plumbing, and they do need to be uh, uh, designed and built by a professional and inspected. Uh, to Does get that permit. technology exist already? Oh, yeah. Oh. There's actually a guy up in Santa Barbara. Uh, Art Ludwig. Art Ludwig. Your son in law. <laughs> interested in gray water, that's the book to get, that's kind of the Bible on gray water. Um, and uh, there's a lot of different ways to do it, from very simple to more advanced. Uh, but you're right, if you're, I mean, our hair clogs our shower today, so uh, you just, you don't want that clogging something where you can't get to it to clean it out. Um, I grew up with tank water behind the house, and we had a flat roof and a flat on the tank water, that's all we had, we ran out, we had no water. But I understand you can't do it here because the Department of Water and Power says the water that comes from the sky is theirs, it's not yours, and you cannot put a tank in your yard. No, that's yeah. in Colorado and Utah. Utah. In Utah, California you can. Um, uh, actually, what, what you will get into if you want to try and do that for portable use within your house is that you will run into a whole bunch of problems. So it's better if you live out in the boonies somewhere, you can probably get <laughs> Australia? Because in Australia, that was the way that all homes were built in the 50s and 60s, and they got away from that. Now they're going back to requiring it on all new homes. Um, it doesn't, although the droughts are longer, so that's the problem, especially around here, is that you can guarantee that we're going to have at least nine months of drought every year. So even if you call five or 10,000 gallons of water, uh, you know, it's kind of a backup water supply as opposed to a primary long-term water supply. Um, it's nice, a place like New Zealand where the storms come in all the time and you're constantly filling in. Um, Hawaii, places like that, that I think is even more practical. All the way in the back. What's the best water to drink? <laughs> the best water to drink? Yes. Filter. Wet. Um, <laughs> what's what's that the place? The safest, the cleanest, the I just think about this. Every time I drive up to the eastern Sierras, there's that water plant right there, and they're getting that mountain spring water and then putting it in bottles. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. 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 Crystal guys. Yeah. 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 Uh, then should we think about the carbon footprint of getting it to our door? <laughs> so that, that's what I was going to say. You know, bottled bottle water has a whole host of side effects. One of them is all these millions and millions of plastic bottles that end up that, yeah. you know, we can't get, seem to get rid of or reuse. Um, and uh, the other thing is that water is very heavy and moving it around uses a lot of energy. So um, buying plastic bottles that came from the Sierras <clears throat> might seem like a good thing, but, you know, they've done a lot of tests on that water and found that it's probably no better than if you have a water filter under your sink and you're filtering water from your own municipal water supply. So, um, Paul, what about the Brita? Is that the little filters that yeah. go on your the, yeah? Yeah. So there's all kinds of you know on your sink filter systems, yeah. and we have one, and I just upgraded from the little Brita one to a, a bigger one that goes under the sink, okay. and you can get those big reverse osmosis, which I think is overkill for drinking water <laughs> under the sink. Um, so um, yeah, there's there's a whole host of ways to purify the water that's delivered to your home as opposed to putting the carbon footprint of transporting water to your home. So what about distilled water? Do you think drinking that distilled water? Your body? You know the water still? Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, that's distilled water has very little minerals in it, and the minerals that come in your water are actually, uh, in general, good for you, as long as it's not arsenic or something like that. So. Um, you know, any water that's delivered to your home is, uh, at least most of the time, clear of uh, uh, levels of, of chemicals that would be harmful to you. So if you then filter that, I think you're in pretty good shape. Distilled water, I think, might, might be going a little too far. But that's just my opinion. Uh, 
so. Uh, only uh, suggestions that uh, you, they had come up with for improving the water in Ventura, the Green Street, the uh, private homes, and then these uh, areas where you would be returning it to wetlands. How successful have you been uh, in So the, the question was, uh, the, the Green Street and wetland restoration that I showed you in Ventura, those are still kind of concept proposals. The city put forth a couple of different Green Street proposals, and it was really interesting. I don't think it was marketed to the neighborhood very well. Um, it wasn't done by us, it was done by the city, and uh, people were afraid of losing their parking. Um, you know, and people are always, uh, you know, afraid of change. And so the green streets, which, by the way, the way that they design them in engineering is very expensive. Um, you know, they had kind of a million dollar block um, that uh, they couldn't get the community to buy into. So this is where our next ramp up with our ocean friendly gardens, we want to do a block park. We want to take a whole block where they have a, a parkway like that and go through and, and curb cut. And we've got a, a guy who will uh, cut concrete for us for cheap. And you get a bunch of uh, volunteers and neighbors out there. You could go through and do, basically build a very cheap green street with um, very, very little uh, 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 investment that I think would be as good as some of the green streets that they're trying to propose. So, um, it's a tough one because it's expensive, and as you know, nobody has any money today, <laughs> or any money to do other things. When you're, when you're putting in the green for your yard, how far down do you have to go with changing what's there? Do you have to put in gravel or anything like that down lower? Or? Uh, for the most part, the idea um, is to actually restore the soil health. And as you restore the health of the soil and you get plants that roots go down, that will increase the permeability of the soil. So you don't have to do anything other than take out the grass and put in these plants. Right, but, but where you have those dry creek beds where you're going to have flowing water on the surface, we line those with the river rocks um, so that you don't end up eroding all that soil away. And so that way that, that breaks down the, the velocity of the water and it sinks in. So in your book, do you have a plan for like a perfectly flat grass in the backyard? Yeah. There's a way to do that. You won't, it won't get any streams or anything. But well, you, you would have to you would have to dig it concave. You could, you could oh. create a channel. Um, you know, the, the other way that I like to describe this is that our traditional landscaping is convex. And, and if you look at things, if you look at the medians in the middle of the street, everything's built convex so that the water runs off of it. We need to turn that upside down and begin to make a concave landscape that captures the water. And so um, you can do that by recontouring your, your grass area. You would actually firm it up over here, and it would be lower down here. And you would plant your plants up here and have your little dry creek bed through the middle. Um, if you reroute your downspout to it, you could have a little bridge. You know, you can make it into a, a really attractive little garden. And can I put fish in that lake? <laughs> You're going to have to line it and keep water in there if you want to fish. <laughs> so, yeah, there are a lot of those design ideas in this book. So if, you, if, you're, if you're interested in learning more, um, keep an eye out for the next Ocean Friendly Gardens series, which I'm not sure what's coming up next. Or uh, just take a look at the book and, and do some research online. Thank you very much. Brochures and flyers over here. Uh, you know, if you'd uh, like to come and take a look. And uh, just thank you very, very much for coming. Thanks for having me. Really interesting. Yep. I just wanted to remind you all that this is this all comes from being out there in the ocean and seeing what comes out there all the time. And then 
having to go upstream, find the source of the problem, and, and try to solve it. And you realize that the problem is absolutely everywhere. Now that you've seen this presentation, you'll be driving down the street tomorrow when it's raining and go, oh my God, that could be fixed. Save that water. Everything will be fixed. Thank you very much.